I know, and, and it's a bit hard to describe it. From your chair. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to another Tuesday Club. Um, I'm not Moira, as, as you may have noticed. <laughs> Uh, I believe Moira's got some competitive croquet or baton or something going on this morning. Uh, so we'll have to catch up with her next month and see how it went. Hopefully she wins. Um, but I, I am here introducing Dr. Kim Morgan, who has been living and working here in Geneva for the last, say, about 12 years. Uh, come over from the States and over the last sort of, 25 years has worked in various universities and theatre companies across New Zealand and the United States. Um, and she's here today to talk about the Dunedin Summer Shakespeare, which was established, as you see, in 2019, and has had quite a wonderful life so far. But I won't say any more. I'll let Kim come up and tell you the story as it. So welcome to the stage. I haven't even done anything for applause yet. <laughs> no, 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 and good morning. I'm truly honored to be here as one of the co-founders of Dunedin Summer Shakespeare. And I will preface this talk with, I am an actor. I am American, though now a proud citizen of New Zealand, and I'm also an academic, so hopefully hearing me will not be a problem. I'm quite accustomed to being up in front of a group of much larger capacity. I do, however, tend to rattle along quickly, and I will try not to do so today, but if at any point I'm going too fast, just please chuck a hand up and I will do my best to go back and slow down, I am aware. So uh, it is my pleasure today to talk to you about the brief but illustrious history of Dunedin Summer Shakespeare, which is very appropriate for me as I am a trained theater historian. That is my job, is to look at the history of theater and now I get to make it. But the story doesn't start with me, it involves a lot of other people and I've largely presented a slideshow today so I can talk you through our five year history and the basics, the who, what, where, when, why, and how, so you can see what we've been up to and then I'm very eager for any questions you have. So just to kick us off with our lovely logo there, uh, Dunedin Summer Shakespeare actually started with these two wonderful wahine who are also dear friends of mine. Jessica Sutherland Latin, who is a Dunedin native. She claims Kaitahu and Scottish descent and has been making theater all around the world. She's trained as far away as Serbia and Paris. She also was one of the co-founders of Ake Ake Theater Company, which has done a lot of work here in Dunedin, including the first ever midwinter carnival. So her roots run deep here. Next to her is my other glorious friend, Lara McGregor, who trained as an actor and director for decades in New Zealand, Australia, a decade in America, very well known as the former associate artistic director of the Court Theatre up in Christchurch, as well as the artistic director of the Fortune Theatre here in Dunedin for five years. We actually met Laura and I while adjudicating Shakespeare scenes for the Shakespeare Globe Centre New Zealand. So the beginning of our friendship is rooted in Shakespeare. As I understand it, because this part does precede me, Jessica did a workshop with Laura as a director, and they started talking about Summer Shakespeare and what great training that is for young artists and also professionals who want to retool. And they lamented that Dunedin used to have some, but it disappeared sometime in the 1990s or the early 2000s, and it's hard to find a lot of information on that. So Jessica was enamored of the idea of bringing Shakespeare back each summer to Dunedin. And she started talking to her friend Laura about it, who then reached out to me, the third of what I like to dub the weird sisters, cribbing from Macbeth. <laughs> uh, I use this term lovingly. We are not indeed witches, though we like to make magic through art. So the three of us started talking in 2018 and 2019 about an annual program. And we three became the co-founders of Dunedin Summer Shakespeare. My background very briefly is I did my doctorate in theater, specifically Shakespeare, history and staging of Shakespeare at the University of Colorado, which was in my hometown, but I chose because it was also home to the Colorado Shakespeare Festival, which is the second oldest Shakespeare festival in North America. 
So I spent many years training there. I also went to Shakespeare and Company on the East Coast to study with them. Shakespeare is my love. I've done two thirds now of the canon, I think. So of the 37, 38 plays, somewhere in the mid 20s. And I can't wait to tackle the rest. This is something I've done my whole life. And when they asked me if I wanted to join, you can imagine how enthusiastic I was. So these are the three of us who started it. But we have some other repeat players I should probably mention. You might recognize on the right over here are Komatua and also in many ways, our principal Kaitatoko, John Broughton, has been our guide and supporter since day one. Uh, Jessica, also the three sisters in this picture, functions as our Kaitiake. If there's ever a question, if we're delving into Te Ao Mori, we will run it by her. But John has also been there to guide us to make sure we don't put a foot wrong and also to come to every show we do, rehearsals. He's there all the time. You may also recognize this lovely smiling face on the bottom. That is Lisa Warrington, who is a fixture in Dunedin Theater, also happens to be a neighbor and friend of mine. She's joined us for two of our mini seasons. And one of our great supporters happens to be a guest in this very series. That's Dr. Jennifer Catermole, who lends us Taungapuro, traditional Maori instruments from time to time and instructs us on how to use them when it's relevant to the production. So we have many people supporting us, but three you might know. Now, I promise this is the only text I'll do. The rest of it will be pictures. But since I've had to write a lot of grants over the years to explain who we are and what we do, I thought I might share our kopapa, our mission statement with you, so you know the what and the why. We want to provide professional quality, free theater. Those two things are very key. We have very lofty goals, and we want to share it with everyone. We don't want to charge for it. And that's led to a lot of grant writing and fundraisers with the second largest city on the South Island. We want to employ and retain seasoned theater artists. After the closure of the fortune, it's been a very hard place to make a living in Dunedin if you are a professional actor. This one gig a year will not pay for anyone's life, but it will make this a more attractive place to stay if you have family and friends and a reason to be here. We're also very committed to training the next generation of theater artists. We want to take young people out of high school, at uni, just starting their career, and pair them with professionals so that they can learn on the boards, actively working side by side, what it is to be a professional artist. And we want to take the enduring appeal of Shakespeare, also the rigorous training that it requires, and combine that with this wonderful place that I've learned to call home. We chose Otepote Dunedin for a reason. We love the history, the makeup of this place. And I wanted to explore that in staging these plays. So we vowed that every time we do a Shakespeare, we'll set it in this place sometime in the history of Otepote Dunedin, and we'll figure out what it means to the people of this time and this place. So that, in a nutshell, is our kopapa. This is a slightly different version of it, which we used for the advertisement for this talk. We're a program that offers professional quality free theater as a movable feast across the city's parks. This is going to be another fun thing to discuss. And we really want to bring Shakespeare to life in fresh, exciting ways. It, isn't ever meant to be that stodgy thing that you have to sit through a lecture, ironically, what we're doing now. We were greatly honored of late to be recognized by the Dunedin Reviewers Collective for our contributions to theater over the last five years. They gave us a special award for outstanding contribution to theater, and I think that speaks a lot to what we've tried to achieve. So we thank them for that recognition. Now to the fun pictures. So now that we've talked about the who, the what, and the why, the where. And there is no one answer. We are indeed a movable feast. We bounce around quite a lot. So our first two years were spent in Woodhall Gardens. So just where the children's area is with the pools, there's a nice break of trees, which is what you see in the back there. And then this lovely glade opens up at the very edge of Woodhall Gardens. Uh, you unfortunately have, if you look beyond that glade of trees, State Highway 1 coming down from Pine Hill with lots of trucks, air braking, honking, 
uh, the odd student parties going on. So it was a lovely venue, but could be a bit problematic for sound and also weather. We did our first season of Romeo and Juliet there, and then we went back for a smaller season of scenes in the following year, right in the middle of the pandemic. Then we moved to the Upper Botanic Gardens for our, our third season and A Midsummer Night's Dream. At least we tried to. We only played outside four out of eight shows. It was one of those lovely Dunedin summers. But this venue, sadly, no longer exists in this form. They've reconfigured it so we can never go back. That was truly a once-off opportunity to perform there. But it was an ideal spot in the native cultivar gardens to tell the story of A Midsummer Night's Dream in Dunedin. The last two years, our home has been Chingford Park, which I'm ashamed to admit I didn't know existed until about three years ago, and I now am absolutely obsessed with such a beautiful venue. We did a series of scenes in the large lawn just across the wooden bridge last year, and then we moved to the upper, more secluded garden this year for our full production of the complete works of William Shakespeare Bridge. I am sure we will be back at Chingford in some way in future, but I love the idea of booming around. I hope to get out to Glenfallock Gardens. I hope to take something out as far as maybe Waitadi, to move around the city, to play again in the Botanic Gardens. Our goal is to take Shakespeare to the people and we'll go to the best venue each year as it presents itself. Now, Dunedin in the summer, LOL as the kids would say, can be a dodgy proposition. So we do also have indoor venues that we rely upon. I didn't put them up here, but I need to thank Dunedin North Intermediate, who has offered us their space many times. We've been to Knox Church. This picture was actually taken uh, opening night of A Midsummer Night's Dream. We opened and closed indoors because the weather was so bad two years ago. This is at Tahao Ora. They gave us their hall to perform in. So we bounce all around, but it's feast or famine. Either we're sweltering out in the sun and our actors are wearing lots of SPF um, using parasols and sunscreen, or you can see from this picture here, my dear friend Jessica as Puck in A Midsummer Night's Dream, people are wearing puffer coats and <laughs> fully masked up on a summer's day outdoors. We even have our own rain logo as it <laughs> tends to be so variable. So. We're prepared for anything. I have once had to stop a show. Midsummer Night's Dream, we had just gotten to the beginning of Act Five. We were 80% through the show, and we had a sudden downpour, and it got so wet and so dangerous, I had to stand up and stop the show for the actors and the audience's safety. Only time I've ever had to do that, hopefully never again. So here's what we've been up to for the past five years. We started off with Romeo and Juliet, and you can see from the credits page, it was our biggest production. We had a cast of 25 people, six pros. The rest were amateurs or young professionals that we couldn't give a contract to, but who volunteered their time. Interestingly, this was meant to be directed by Laura McGregor. She was going to take the first year. I was going to take the second year, rolling through. And then she was offered a Netflix series just after we finished taping. In fact, I realize now belatedly, I did a lovely send up of um, both of the ladies before, but I didn't mention that Laura is off working. She just finished Shortland Street, as well as doing lots of different series around. So work called and I stepped in to do Romeo and Juliet, which I had done a half dozen times before but never like this. It's absolutely my favorite production I've been able to do of this. So this is what or how it started. First season was extra special because we did a series of workshops. We wanted to build a company. So we took all of our young and veteran actors and had them do six full day workshops. We taught them Shakespearean text. We taught them movement. This is Jessica and her husband, Reese, learning complicite, which is a style of physical movement through dance that she has studied in Europe. Uh, what I'm holding in my hand there on the left is the text primer I would do with them afterwards. Can't see from the front, but this is Stefan Jordan, who very kindly volunteered his time to teach our cast Morocco 
fighting with traditional staves and weapons. So for Romeo and Juliet, everybody learned this and we didn't have swords. We went and found Colladi, the center of flax plants, and used them as our staves and weapons, tying it to this place. And they were pretty amazing what they picked up in the couple of sessions they had with him. So lots of workshops to build skills and build a company. And then when we got to Woodhall Gardens for our nine performances, we were so blessed to have everybody turn out, both as actors and as audience. We had at least six professional actors, six who were contracted, several more who volunteered their time. So over here as our formidable prince, Fran Kewene, who is now up in Wellington, but a veteran of Dunedin stages. Phil Grieve, you might recognize, who's been in several of our productions, a wonderful Friar Lawrence for modern times. Uh, this is Siale Tunoka, who did many shows at the Fortune. He was our Lord Capulet. This is Jessica's husband, Reese, who was our Lord Montague, a very important moment where we could draw on New Zealand tradition to bring this story home at the end with the reconciliation of the families. We also had some young professionals, Emily McKenzie and Nick Tipa on either side as our young star-crossed lovers. And the amazing Julie Edwards was our nurse for this production. So you can see we had an embarrassment of riches to start off. Uh, we also got to have some fun with casting, and this is becoming more and more common with Shakespeare. This lovely young lady I actually met in the Shakespeare Globe Center New Zealand school production when she was 15. This is her maybe six years later studying law at uni before she went off to work on national radio. And she was our Mercutio. That is a common thing now where we're starting to cast different genders, opening up casting. And uh, this is another of Romeo's mates. So we had a mixed group here to more reflect contemporary society. One of our closing performances, you can see Romeo and Tybalt fighting with Morocco. This young man right here, Tomori Spicer, has been with our company for many years. He was 16 maybe at the time he did this. He's now a 660 scholarship recipient and about to graduate from uni and quite an accomplished musician. So we get an amazing group of talented artists. And we learn something with this show, which I hope we get to carry on. We were working in a space that was beautiful, that was at the heart of Dunedin with a diverse company. And we started to think about how we tie it to this place. So we considered having a karanga, a proper call, to start the production. But then we realized that the prologue, two households, both alike in dignity, and fair Verona, where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. That was our karanga, our call. So we had uh, an actor, Tomori, who I pointed out earlier, use the putatra, the conch, to call everybody's attention to the stage. And then the cast came out and encircled the entire audience. And one by one, they spoke the lines of the prologue to Romeo and Juliet. They shared it as a company. We established a space to play in. So when we got to the end of the story, and its loss of many characters, including our title characters, we decided we needed to cleanse the space, to let go, because it can be such a heavy story after all the comedy. So we chose to perform a wayata at the end, and we chose Fakatakatehau. And the audience joined in with us as we went through several versions of this. And this is closing day. We were treated to a standing ovation. What you can't see is there's about 500 people on the lawn at Woodhall. It was absolutely packed. And we learned that this sense of completion, of ending the story with something that is tied to this place, made Shakespeare even more relevant. So whenever possible, we've carried on that tradition. The next year, you might recognize that little sticker over there on the right. Uh, we had to do things a little bit differently. 35 days after Romeo and Juliet closed, the first New Zealand lockdown was announced. All of our lives changed drastically. We thought about canceling our second season, but didn't have the heart to. So we chose instead, in an era of uncertainty, when we didn't know if actors would be around, if audiences would come out, to do a very small season. 
So we chose scenes from three plays that were about love and laughter. And instead of doing A Midsummer Night's Dream, what I had intended to direct, we did A Midsummer Day's Scenes instead uh, for two days back at Woodhull Gardens. So, Twelfth Night, this is when Lisa Warrington joined us and she directed bits and pieces of the early part of the play. Much Ado About Nothing, Jessica and Phil Vaughn were directed live by Laura McGregor. You got a backstage look at what an actor does as a director stopped them, gave them notes, asked them to go back and redo things. And then I took one of my favorites with our younger company members, Love's Labor's Lost, which is about a group of men who valiantly take an oath to forego women in favor of studies. And then the beautiful women show up five minutes later and their plans are all shot to you know where. So uh, here's just some quick shots from that season. Uh, Sarah Georgie and Sophie Morris, the opera singer, uh, national singer, she's done many other things, she joined us that season. We have Phil and Jessica. You don't see Laura, but she would be around directing them in that scene. Phil Vaughn again playing um, some ukulele for us. And these are scenes from Love's Labor's Lost, my comedy, which we played in and around the audience. They were hiding instead of behind trees, behind audience members. We like to be interactive. We put people in the audience whenever possible. Romeo had to pick his way through 400 people to get from the tree that he was up to watch Juliet on her balcony over to the bench where she was standing for her balcony. That's the ethos of Dunedin Summer Shakespeare. Even when it drives the actors a little crazy, and it does, we like to put them in the midst of the audience to make it immediate, never separate over there. And then we got back to a full production for our third year, but COVID was not done with us before we got there. A Midsummer Night's Dream, full production that we took to the Upper Botanic Gardens in 2022. This one I directed again, and I was two years into the pandemic waiting for the other shoe to drop. We knew in December and early January that the rules were going to change, so we adapted to them, and we planned on an audience of only 100 people, indoors or out, because it met the regulations. We also planned to film and post to YouTube, and you can still find this production on YouTube. I'll make sure I send the link along to the Otago Settlers Association, so if you want to watch it, you can. But when we did this in February of 2022, as Delta variant arrived in New Zealand, we were the only live theater on the Motu. Everyone else had shut down, but because we did Shakespeare outside, or moved indoors with very strict limits and an amazing production manager to help us manage that, we could continue our entire season. We sold out all eight shows. We had to ticket it that year, no cost, but you had to have a ticket to control numbers, and had a wait list four times as long to get in, which is why we taped it. So in the middle of all of this rubbish brought on by a pandemic, we were able to create something really glorious up at the Botanic Gardens. So that's Barbara Power as Titania, Nick Tipa, Romeo before, now he's back as bottom, and Jessica Latin as our puck. And she was able to bring in several traditions. We looked a little bit at the patu pairehe, the traditional sprites and spirits of Maori lore, as well as all the different nationalities of the cast. I asked them, what does a fairy mean to you? And we brought all of that into the table. So we had a very diverse look at what fairies and magic were. This is particularly fun because Jessica is using a poi to create sound and to weave a spell as Puck, our chief sprite. We actually tried to use the pura rehua, the bull roarer, in a rehearsal or two, and it felt wrong. It just had a weird energy that wasn't matching the lightness of the scene. So we went back to Jennifer Cattermole and we got the poi instead and it turned into a wonderful moment of magic but not nearly as ominous. You can also see all the people masked up because this was as Delta was arriving and also rugged up in puffer coats once again. This is the season where we had four shows indoor and three and three quarters shows outdoor. This is the one I had to call for rain for safety. Uh, we learned a lot from Romeo and Juliet to the point of I decided even though A Midsummer Night's Dream doesn't have a prologue, I gave it a prologue because it works so well in Romeo and Juliet. So I took lines from various parts of the play 
And the company came out and their beautiful apparel by Sophie McDuff and uh, Sophie Welvert, I should say, that's her online name. And they formed a circle looking at the audience who surrounded them. And one by one, they spoke the lines of this prologue to weave a spell and to bring them into the space like we did at Romeo and Juliet. And when we were done, we were able to take a bit of one of Lord's current songs and sing a song of joy and summer at the end as everybody walked out. So again, a chance to sort of bookend Shakespeare in this time and place. So just a couple of quick snapshots from another large company. We had 20 people involved. Our young lovers, you'll see in various combinations here, a very diminutive pair and a very statuesque pair. Uh, this gentleman in particular deserves special note. He was my assistant director. He came to train with me. He'd already done a fair amount of Shakespeare, including with Michael Hurst up in Auckland, and he wanted to do more. We lost an actor during the course of rehearsals, so he stepped in to one of the leading roles, in addition to assistant directing, and did a lot of heavy lifting on this production. Uh, these are our fairy group. This is the young man Tomori I mentioned earlier, who was our Tybalt in Romeo and Juliet, one of our lead fairies. Phil Grieve is back as Quince, leading the mechanicals, our rude mechanicals, the workers who do the wonderful play in the play. And with his back to you, wearing the smart ass emblem, that is Nick Tipa once again as bottom before he gets transformed into an ass for the pleasure of the fairies. So uh, here's some more shots. We keep things very simple. We just brought in a hanging chair for Titania's bower. So once bottom was enchanted, turned into an ass. That's where he and his lover hung out. Very simple props. Everyone was attired in overalls that made them look like they were gardeners at the Botanic Gardens. We even had special patches made for them. Used mop heads and commercially available hats for the play within the play. And we had this lovely mixing of traditional Shakespearean elements, fairies, and things that were specifically of this place. So Titania and Oberon are warring fairy rulers, matched by Theseus and Hippolyta, he of more Scottish descent, she wearing a corduroy, which makes her more of this place. They met in battle, and now they're getting married, and they have a new accord. These people are often played by the same actors, but we split the roles up. So we had a great time making it of this time and place as well. And then for our fourth season, because it is very hard to carry this load, and by this time, Laura had to leave us to do other work, and Jessica and I were keeping the um, train going, as it were, we decided to do another mini season, a smaller season of scenes. So for our first year in Chingford Park, we did Magic in the Air. And Lisa Warrington came back to do bits of The Tempest, the beginning of the play. Uh, Jessica Latin did bits of the beginning of Macbeth. And I did a play I swear I'd never do, The Merry Wives of Windsor which I've seen some dreadful productions of, and they stuck with me, so this was my redemption. I got to do a very small version of it and hopefully save it from what I remembered. So this event in Chingford Park um, was only for three days, but we had a good three, 400 people turn out a night in the park. These are all scenes from The Tempest that Lisa Warrington did. So lots of flights of fancy using rudimentary things. So Prospero, the magician, played by Sarah Georgie, creates this wonderful doppelganger using a tent and a mask. Ariel, the spirit of the island, is split into two by two very close-looking sisters. They're not twins, but you'd swear they are, moving beautifully under blue sheets. Caliban, who is enslaved by Prospero, was embodied by one actor, but to start was two people writhing underneath a sheet to make this amorphous form. And they had a lot of fun with bubbles and balls. And if you can see it, that's a little shark dispenser popping out the bubbles there as they're talking about the shipwreck that lands everybody on the island. So that was the first joyous piece followed by a much weightier version of the opening of Macbeth, which was both directed and starring my friend Jessica as one of the weird sisters incarnate, the witches, 
and that is Macbeth and Banquo in the early going as they meet the witches for the first time and the prophecy is made that Macbeth will be king but also many other bad things will befall. And then we ended the day on something light, The Merry Wives of Windsor, which very briefly is about John Falstaff. Phil Grieve was born to play this role. Uh, a man who loves the pleasures of life and decides, ill-fatedly, to woo two happily married women to try and get them to pay his bills with the same love letter. They very quickly figure out what he's up to and put him to a lot of embarrassing tasks last of which is to put on a stag's horns and go out into the forest where they dress up as fairies, giving me a chance to recycle part of Titania's costume from the year before and also Puck's costume as well. And they torture him in the play with fairies and magic. In our version, we took pool noodles and some very obliging audience members who were happy to go and beat the stuffing out of him for being such a naughty boy. Last but not least, the season we've just completed. This is the complete works of William Shakespeare, Abridged, a play that was actually written by three Americans in the late 80s, early 90s, and then went to London's West End, where I saw it. It is all 37 plays in 97 minutes. It is all of Shakespeare in brief space. They do cheat a little bit to get there. So I'll walk you through it, and we have some great p images that just came in. We got to bring my dear friend Lara McGregor back to be our director this year. We lured her back from all the film and other work to be here in Dunedin, and she had a grand time doing this with a cast of three actors. That's all it was to play more than 1,100 roles. So Sarah Georgie was back from The Tempest. She's now, in this case, being a Shakespeare scholar. Nick Tipa was back, his third round with us. Romeo, Bottom, and now half of Shakespeare's plays including Romeo and Bottom, he got to play again. And Greg Cooper, this is Juliet on her balcony, standing up on a chair covering another actor with his skirt. Uh, Greg Cooper is an amazing actor, playwright, and director who's just come back to Dunedin. So we're very thrilled to have him and roped into Summer Shakespeare. So this play looks at all of Shakespeare. It does abbreviated versions of Romeo and Juliet, and then a few other plays before it realizes it's running out of time. So it smushes lots of things together. So that's Romeo and Juliet up there. Nick dressed up as the nurse with a little bit of fake cleavage. Greg as Juliet. Laura down there directing one of the hilarious scenes in our rehearsal space. They are going a little bit too slow, so they decide to speed things up. Troil sorry, Troilus and Cressida, wrong play. <laughs> Titus Andronicus, Shakespeare's bloodiest play, where people get cooked and served up to other family members, is turned into a reality TV cooking show, and they have a lot of fun with that. Othello, the Moor of Venice, he mistakenly looks up the word moor as a place to lodge boats, and so that's the gag in that very short version. They do all the comedies, which is up center, as a five minute throw every single comedy, all 17 of them, into one little show by mixing all the plots together. They do Macbeth, or the Scottish play, with the worst Scottish accents and stereotypes you can imagine. And they condense all of the history plays into a rugby match, where the crown is the ball that gets rattled around, and King Lear is made to leave the field for being a fictional character. So a lot of fun is had all in act one. They check the program, they realize they've done every Shakespeare play except for Hamlet. And that becomes all of act two. They do Hamlet repeatedly, comically, ridiculously. So the ghost of Hamlet's father, Hamlet having a word with Claudius, the play within the play, which is hand puppets. Uh, and ultimately, they end up doing it in two minute, one minute, and then a backwards one minute version of Hamlet as the final encore, hence the boo sign becoming oob. So it was a bit of um, a bit of a piss take, if you'll pardon my French, of Shakespeare himself, which I think he would have greatly approved of, looking at with laughter, but also in a few places, great sincerity, everything that he's done. And we thought that was great for our fifth anniversary season. So to wrap up, so we do have time for a few questions. I would be greatly remiss if I didn't say a few words about how we get to do this. 
We are free Shakespeare in the park every year. And the only way that works is through the generosity of the Dunedin City Council. They have a professional theater fund. It's a competitive fund we apply for every year. And we've thus far been very lucky to be funded in part by them. Otago Community Trust has also given us money for the three bigger shows. And Castle Trustees has sort of become our angels. Three years ago, they stepped in to start doing fundraisers for us. They give us legitimacy as our sponsor to go out and apply for grants. And they hold the money for us, so it's all on the up and up. And they hold a fundraiser every year at their beautiful home. And they invite people. And it is a private performance to fundraise for Dunedin Summer Shakespeare. So without these three principal sponsors, we wouldn't exist. But it also takes a village, as they say. Stage South, which is the group of professional artists in the Lower South Island, has auspiced us for a number of years. We did a Give a Little campaign our first year to get up and running. And just this year, we had more than 200 props, costumes, etc., on loan from Playhouse, MTD, the court up in Christchurch, Fire Station in Mosgiel, and the Globe Theater up the hill. It really does take a village to do this. And we are truly thankful for the support that we get. So where to next? The final slide. There will be more Shakespeare in a park near you. I just can't guarantee which park it might be. We are going to continue probably alternating full seasons of full productions, which take a lot of effort, time, and planning, with the smaller seasons, which still take a lot of time and planning, but aren't quite as much of a load to carry. And that allows us to do a balance and also to get a lot of Shakespeare out that we might not otherwise do. I don't think we'll ever do a full production of The Merry Wives of Windsor. But people now know a little bit about the show because it was part of last year's offering. Titles that have been mentioned but nothing committed to yet. The Tempest, Twelfth Night, Macbeth for a Scottish town, The Comedy of Errors, Much Ado About Nothing, The Winter's Tale, and I want to, at some point, tackle King Lear, but as it is a monumental play, I'm thinking maybe focusing more on the kids in the play, Lear's daughters and Gloucester's sons, maybe doing a distillation of it. We also, for the mini seasons, already have themes picked out. Let's talk about the fools in Shakespeare. The clowns are great. Parents and children, which is where the Lear idea came out of. The sonnets, which make for really good staging. And something you'll probably see in the next two years, this is my newest idea, but I'm in love with it already, as are our local musicians. If music be the food of love, what if we hire a dozen local musicians who are also doing it hard right now, very hard to make a living in the arts, and we ask them to take a song from Shakespeare, a sonnet, a speech, even the plot to an entire play, and turn it into a new musical creation. And then I want to see if we can get the band shell at the Botanic Gardens and create a concert that is Shakespeare in song, if music be the food of love. So you're the first people publicly, this group, that I've told that to. Only a few people inside I've whispered it to. But in the next two years, I hope to make that a reality. We might, at some point, invite a show on tour to come in and either fill our slot or augment to help grow our season. We know of several good artists touring around. And we might think about doing some related plays. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. A riff on Hamlet, two minor characters, sort of behind the scenes. That might have a place sometime in future, just like the complete works that we did isn't by Shakespeare, but it's all about Shakespeare. And last but not least, we've had some fun musings about, what if we did a radio play or something like that in the winter when we're not doing a full production? But we read all of Shakespeare with rehearsal and intent. We had Foley artists. There's a couple of plays, some of the romances, that would lend themselves really well to that. There's also some spoofs of Shakespeare, which would be kind of fun. So we're always thinking about what the next thing is. So I can't tell you what our next season is, but I can promise that there will be more Shakespeare in a park near you next summer. Thank you. So I've, I've rattled on a bit, but I didn't go too terribly long. We definitely have time for questions. And I am told you are a very inquisitive bunch. So what questions can I answer or attempt to answer that any of the proceeding may have brought up? Mm. Yes, please. Thank you for the talk. And thank you for the 
a couple of performances that I missed, that was really great. Um, I was just curious about what kind of response you, you get when you um, give the audience an opportunity to, to make donations mm -hmm. afterwards, which I think is really great, because while it's absolutely golden that you're making it available free to everybody, there are people who can afford to support it, um, and, and it's you know, a way to sort of help, help keep it going. And of, of course, I'm not asking for numbers or anything like that. I'm just curious as to whether there, there was a good response to that. There is indeed. And I'm so glad you asked that, because I was remiss in saying these are our sponsors, but our audiences have also kept Summer Shakespeare alive. Each year, we have humbly accepted Koha, and that has grown and grown and grown. So the first year was modest. The next year, people sort of knew about it. And now this year, our fifth anniversary season was, I think, three or four times what I projected would come in in Koha. So it doesn't pay for the season by any stretch of the imagination. It's less than it's maybe 5% of what we need to do the season. But it is a hugely important part. So we have the fundraiser, and we have individuals who donate. And we try to make a quick announcement that it is free at the end. Anyone's welcome to come as many times as they like. But when we invite people to donate, they have been incredibly generous. And that goodwill from the community is a huge part of what keeps us going. Any other questions? Stage in London at the Globe? I have, but not for a formal performance. I've studied at the Globe, I've given some lectures at the Globe, and I've definitely seen many performances at the Globe. So I've walked the boards, I've played on them, but not while anyone watched. So I'm afraid <laughs> I don't have pictures of that, but it is a dream of mine. Did I say, oh, yes, absolutely. And Don Sanders is a friend of mine who was behind that effort. The beautiful tapestries that are the back of the globe, and I wish I had a picture here, I usually do, were made of New Zealand wool and embroidered here and sent to the globe as a gift. So there is a part of New Zealand on stage, the beautiful tapestries that hang at the back, as well as on the main gate. A friend of ours out on the peninsula, Guy Gary, who is a metal smith, an iron right, made a shrimp out of wrought iron that is on the gates the, uh, that as you enter the globe from the banks of the Thames, they commissioned artists from all over the globe to make versions of all the animals that were mentioned in Shakespeare, and they adorn the front gate. So there's a lovely New Zealand connection to the globe there as well. At the globe? Yes. Wasn't it magical? <laughs> now, I will say, I love performances at the Globe. In Shakespeare's day, it would have felt a little bit different, as authentic as they were recreating it. This is where the theater historian comes out. Currently, the Globe will allow 1,200 people in. That is modern fire regulations, all of that. A packed day for Shakespeare would have been upwards of 3,000 people in the exact same space. So it would have been a very crowded, very lively theater. But to see it in a full audience, to see the magic of Shakespeare on that stage is truly amazing. Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, if you're thinking of different uh, venues, you know, parks and around and about, and obviously when, uh, of course, the University of Otago, there's summer school, but that's not, it's not too congested with students. So mm -hmm. the areas within campus that you potentially could be and things like the Infatic and then as you work your way along <coughs> Queen's Drive, you know, the lookout um, that's off uh, High Street looking down on the city or a park within Maori Road, there is another one there. We move right around to Prospect Park. There, there are any number of parks that you, you could uh, there are indeed, and that's one of the favorite parts of my job, is it being a movable feast. I get to go out and explore this beautiful place I've chosen to call home and find these venues. So again, Chingford Park, I'm embarrassed to say, didn't know about until three years ago. Now I spend a huge amount of time there. I live out on the Otago Peninsula, so I have a lot of dream places out there, and I'm getting to know Greater Dunedin. So I hope to continue to make this a movable feast. Chingford is wonderful. It's so accommodating. It's easy to get to. A lot of people know it. But there's no plan to plant our flag in any one place. We tend to keep moving. And whatever best suits the play is where we'll go. There's even been mention of maybe we take it to the beach someday, if that's appropriate for a play, if we're doing a play that happens to reference a shipwreck, the sea, anything else, or it feels like a beach party. So we're always on the lookout. 
Any other questions? Chatted your ear off giving you so much for an hour. Well, we're almost exactly at 11, so if there aren't any other questions, I'll stick around. If you have anything you want to ask me in person, I'm more than happy to sit and chat uh, for as long as you'd like to. But otherwise, I'd just like to thank you so much for having us in. And on behalf of all the artists who make up Dunedin Summer Shakespeare, thank you for listening to this work. I hope you get to come out and see it. Every year, we have more and more people come to see it. This year, we had about 1,500 people. We've pushed up towards 2,000 on some seasons, depending on how long they are. And yet I still have people say, this happens in Dunedin? How did I not know about this? So please spread the word, let people know, and hopefully we will see you on a lawn somewhere next summer. Thank you.